When the railways began to spread more than 200 years ago, their impact on architecture was nothing short of revolutionary. To serve these marvellous machines, whole new kinds of buildings sprang up. From the outlandishly ornate... The things you find on buildings. ...to hidden gems. I never thought I'd get to see this. ...and railway wonders of the world. Now, this is what I call extreme train spotting. Now, with privileged access... We are swinging. Oh, my goodness. ...and rarely seen designs. Oh, this is the famous watercolour. I want to show you how each and every one of these remarkable structures tells the story of how the railways have changed the way we live... You're standing in the middle of history. ...forever. Today, we'll visit a station where movie magic was made and railway traditions live on. It's a fabulous bit of Victorian engineering and it's, it's great to still have it working. I'll explore a railway story that's truly monumental. This has a feel of ancient Egypt. It's almost like building the, the pyramids. And scale the heights of what is surely the greatest railway bridge in the world. I looked down. I did look down. I did look down. Look. Climb aboard as I explore the architecture the railways built. The railways have struck extraordinary marks right across our landscape. Remarkable feats of engineering. Fascinating stations, often works of art in their own right, have become a much-loved part of our national life. And icons of our time. I'm making my way to Scotland, and happily, via the scenic route. But I'm not just here to take in the stunning views. I'm on a pilgrimage to visit an astonishing railway structure and a great Scottish landmark. The Forth Bridge. Almost 2,500 metres long and comprising a massive 53,000 tonnes of steel, the Forth Bridge is without doubt one of the engineering wonders of the world. Granted privileged access to this steel giant from top to bottom, my journey will take me from learning about its foundations deep under the Firth of Forth to exploring its summit 110 metres above the water. Let's be honest, this railway structure doesn't really need an introduction at all. The Forth Bridge is truly iconic. It is one of the most magnificent pieces of engineering anywhere in the British Isles. But what you might not realise is that it isn't the only thing the railways built around here. This is Bridge House, built by the North British Railway Company to accommodate its chief engineers during construction of the Forth Bridge. The very English mock Tudor frontage of the house is completely out of keeping with the area. But this design does point to the fact that the Forth Bridge would establish a new connection between English and Scottish railways. I'm told the views from the flats the house contains today are spectacular. Owner Barry Wright is showing me around. Yeah, come on in. This is our... Come and see the house. Oh, isn't this lovely? <laughs> it's, uh, it's my favourite view. <laughs> I can see why. Not just one view, though. Yeah. Three different views. That's right. That's just, and it's, and you got a you got a portrait one, you got landscape one, <laughs> and you got one in the corner. From this room, there's a near panoramic outlook, taking in three magnificent bridges built in three different centuries: the Fourth Bridge, the Fourth Road Bridge, and beyond it, the Queen's Ferry Crossing. I think this one was a, 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 
a lounging room a, a, rather than a workroom. And they had huge uh, uh, rooms, 100 feet long, to, to, to do plans in. They did plans at full size. Wow. Yeah, we go and sit in the corner there and uh, you get the full perspective of the, from the sun coming up to the sun going down. Bridge House's original resident was the renowned railway engineer Thomas Bouch. Fresh from constructing the Tay Bridge 40 miles away, the fourth bridge was to be his next great project. But in 1879, just 18 months after opening, the Tay Bridge collapsed, killing 75 people and irreparably damaging Bouch's reputation. Bouch's plan for the fourth bridge was abandoned. Engineers John Fowler and Benjamin Baker replaced him, overseeing the building of their new design for the bridge. And after the Tay Bridge disaster, you can imagine they would have been rather keen to keep a close eye on construction. I could stare at the bridge they created all day long, but the joy of my job is the chance to experience architecture in ways that very few can. So, despite my fear of heights, the time has come to don my high-vis and get acquainted with this astonishing bridge. To discover more about the sheer size of the project to build it, I'm heading for its Fife Pier on the north bank of the Forth to meet local historian Len Saunders. This bridge is the largest cantilever bridge, but it's also one of the largest man-made structures on the planet. The scale of this is, is just massive. It was a space age project of its era. It, it was just so far ahead of anything that had ever been designed or built. Um, and it's, it's such an immovable, strong, iconic thing. It's just an amazing bridge. Though when work began on the bridge's foundations in 1883, the pressure was very much on. Because apart from the formidable engineering challenges, the project faced another hurdle. Just four years earlier, the disaster on the River Tay had rocked public confidence in bridge building. So one of the aims of this bridge was to build something that not only was strong, it had to be free of movement or vibration. It had to be the most rigid possible bridge that you could build. Anything that was built here had to just be bulletproof. To achieve this, the engineers came up with the revolutionary cantilever design, which would allow the bridge to absorb up to 56 pounds of wind pressure per square foot. That's enough to withstand a hurricane blowing from both ends. Is this where construction of the bridge started here on the north bank? There were three construction sites, one at each side and one on the island in the middle of the river here. So for three years, there wasn't that much to see in, in those locations because the, the men were actually working below water level. And that was an, a, a huge task in itself. This crossing point on the Firth of Forth is an incredible 75 metres deep. So to build the six huge underwater support piers, men had to work in giant pressurised towers known as caissons and problems soon became clear. The men were suffering badly. The, the deeper they got, the worse the problem was. Nobody really knew what it was, what caused it, other than they knew that the longer they were in and the deeper they went, the, the problem was worse. Working at depths approaching 30 metres, the men were afflicted by an illness which caused agonising joint pain, paralysis and, in some cases, death. This condition was termed caisson's disease. Today, we know this decompression sickness as the bends. In 1886, the foundations were finally complete and the epic construction of the bridge above water level could begin. It was quite the feat of coordination. You needed to grow each cantilever at the same pace and then join them together, so they all had to be started more or less at the same time. Incredibly complex logistics then. You have to consider how big a step forward this bridge was. I mean, the, the longest span bridge in Britain before this one was, was something like 400 odd feet. 
but this has two spans of 1,710 feet. These superb drawings highlight the complexity of building the bridge. They show that after six years of construction, only the red and blue areas had been completed, with the grey sections representing the remaining work. Progress was so laborious because of the unique way the bridge had to be built. This is a handmade bridge because all the parts were made so that no single component was much more than about two tons. We were building out over the sea, it was all cantilevered out, and you couldn't have huge loads. You had to build it slowly, slowly, and put in all the connection pieces before you could go a little bit further out. So everything was in manageable chunks. Because actually, if you look up here, you suddenly realise just how small each component is that's been riveted together. Rivets, six and a half million of them, were integral to the assembly of the bridge. And after seven years of construction right around the clock, the final, allegedly golden rivet was inserted by the Prince of Wales in March 1890. The fourth bridge was at last officially open, and it would prove to be an enduring triumph. You can hardly imagine this river not having this bridge above it. <laughs> it just looks right. It's just such a fantastic icon of strength and solidity. It is probably one of the greatest symbols of the railway conquering the natural landscape and permanence and security and this idea of, of giving faith in engineering again. A truly a railway wonder of the world. Yeah, absolutely. I cannot wait to learn more about this breathtaking achievement in railway engineering. But to do that, the only way is up. Oh, look at this. Whose idea was this? I'm in the east of Scotland, exploring the engineering icon that is the extraordinary Forth Bridge. A mighty piece of railway architecture that was seven years in the making. Now, thanks to hoist operator Michael Berry, I'm about to get a special view of the bridge from up on high, and I'm hoping local historian Len Saunders will help me keep my fear of heights in check. You have to feel safe if you're going up the strongest bridge in the world. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'll buy that. Yes, I, I like your rationale. It's not so much what's supporting us I get worried about. It's more what there isn't underneath. Thank you. <laughs> so this is oh. us at the boffy level. Wow. Look at this. Oh, I'm hanging on. <laughs> Look at this. It's a little house. Yeah. I don't like that bit at all. <laughs> you can see straight down. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh. That's fun. Oh, look, there's a kettle. <laughs> yeah, put the kettle on. Time for a cup of tea, Len. <laughs> Sounds like a good idea. We've come to a bothy, a shelter on the bridge where workers could eat, rest, or just seek refuge from the weather. The original bothies, I believe, would have been wood. And over the years, they would have been upgraded and altered. So this would not be exactly as per the original bothies, but guys would be using it for exactly the same reasons. Absolutely, because the outside of it is like a patchwork of slightly rusty steel, yeah. isn't it? It's sort um, of patched up. I would say it's got character. <laughs> At its height, the workforce reached an incredible 4,600 men. Known as Briggers, it's through their fortitude and bravery we're able to enjoy the bridge today. Who 
who were the men building this bridge? Were they, were they like the navvies well, you came across from Ireland? Well, many of them were come from the shipyards um, because the bridge is riveted and that's how ships were built. So they had the experience of rivets. And then, of course, you had joiners and painters. And the, the, they were about a third Scottish, third English, and about a third Irish. And many of them are just traveling from job to job. Looking now at the complexity and sheer height of this structure, it's not difficult to imagine that the working lives of the Briggers would have been incredibly hazardous. How dangerous was it trying to build the bridge? We have the death certificates for 73 um, people that died building this bridge. 38 of them fell. Others were crushed. Others were struck from above, objects falling from above. They used to think, many of the men used to think it was safer to work at the top. Although they were high up, they couldn't be struck by something falling on them. No hard hats in those days. Some of the people that died were little more than children. Nobody thought anything of 13 or 14 year olds climbing about the bridge, putting in rivets and heating rivets. And, but there was always the, the hazards, there were so many hazards and so many men working for seven years that it was almost inevitable. As part of a group of dedicated local historians and genealogists, in the late 1990s, Len set out to identify the names of every man and boy who had died during construction. Why was it important to you to find out about these men and, and, and what happened to them? Well, the, the object at the beginning was to build a memorial, and that was why we were asked, can you find out who they were? So if we, whatever the memorial was, we would be able to put their names on it. It was a challenge. It became a, a labour of love. In 2012, twin memorials were unveiled, one at each end of the bridge. They commemorate the 73 known fatalities of Briggers. The men did their bit. They kept going and overcome all the difficulties. And here we are, 132 years later. The bridge is still here. It's really, this is the memorial to the Briggers. Wow. Len's words are so apt. This glorious bridge is a vital transport link, an astonishing engineering accomplishment, and an icon for our times. But, above all, in the most extraordinary and striking way, it honours the men who died building it. I'm behind the scenes at the National Railway Museum in York, home to so many treasures. It's wonderful to have special access here and to see these particularly fascinating examples of historic railway architecture. They were once part of London's first intercity station, Euston. Among the intriguing pieces from that station's past, there's one that's especially difficult to miss. A truly spectacular sculpture. But there's one piece of Euston Station that's become a lost icon. The first great monument of the railway age, the enormous 22 metre tall Euston Arch. Erected in the 1830s, for well over a century, it commanded the entrance to the station. To find out more about this extremely grand and somewhat controversial piece of railway construction, I'm meeting the museum's head curator, Andrew McLean. Hello, Andrew. Hello, Tim. Nice to see you. Good to see you. Now, what have you brought out of the archives? Well, they're going to go right back to the building of the original Euston Station. And in this box are some of the finest treasures in our collection, some of the finest illustrations anywhere of railway construction during the railway mania of the 19th century. Very rarely seen. Don't tell me these are the born engravings, are they? You're partly right. They're not engravings. These are the original born drawings of the construction of Euston Station. Oh, wow. John Cook Bourne was the Victorian artist who captured the building of the London and Birmingham Railway, which opened in 1838. This is, this is very special, Andrew. These are the original pen and wash no. illustrations. So this one here shows the original Euston Arch under construction. I can't believe you got these out. So you have these incredible masses of stone um, being worked on by the stonemasons. If you look at the scale 
of these columns, look at the scale of the scaffold. This has a feel of ancient Egypt. It's almost like building the, the pyramids. But that's the point, isn't it? They were saying at the London and Birmingham Railway, this is a new civilization, this is the new route through. In terms of engineering, nothing had been done on this scale since the time of the Romans or the Egyptians. It really is incredible what was achieved there. And look down here, and you can see the train shed at the railway station. It's quite small scale there. You can actually start to get a sense of how maybe slightly disappointing the station was compared to the arch itself. The amazing thing about Bourne was he went back to the site to document the construction as it progressed. So the next image we have of his shows more of the arch under construction here, and it's starting to really take shape. And you can see all the chunks and how all the blocks were linked together. I mean, this is an engineering drawing as much as it is a scene of daily work. It is, and if you look closely, you can see how it was constructed, you know, how hoists and so on were used to lift big blocks of stone up. But also by looking at the, the stonemasons themselves, you can actually get a sense of the scale of how big this arch was. Because you know, look at the size of this man here, and then look at the big blocks of stone beside him. I mean, this is a monumental undertaking. And of course, Bourne had to go back to document the finished arch and the arch in use. This is a pretty spectacular image. I mean, that does look nicer than the actual arch did in the end. It's rather finer and more graceful than the actual construction. It did. I mean, of course, buildings started to get closer to the arch. The arch was more set back um, originally. And, of course, you see here, it's been unsullied by the suits and the dust and smuts yeah. there of, you know, of over a century of, um, of London's pollution that uh, started to disfigure it by the end. So this is a very much fresh and new and looking spectacular, this great symbol of the railway age. But how was this gigantic piece of railway architecture lost? I'm at the National Railway Museum in York, where I'm being given the chance to see items normally hidden from view. Head curator Andrew McLean is showing me historic drawings of a famous but lost railway monument, the Euston Arch. And I'm about to get controversial. I mean, I'm gonna say this now. <laughs> I can't stand the Euston Arch. I think it's one of the ugliest pieces of railway architecture that was ever wrought and constructed in this country. And I'm quite glad it doesn't exist anymore. You're not alone in thinking that because maybe the greatest architect of the 19th century Augustus Pugin actually criticised the arch and criticised Euston Station. He really didn't like it at all. Despite the disdain of contemporary critics like Pugin, the enormous arch would dominate Euston Station for over 120 years. Then, in early 1960, the British Transport Commission served notice that it planned to sweep away the whole of the original station, including the arch. Vigorous protests followed, led by the poet Sir John Betjeman, the Architectural Review, and several MPs. This campaign to save the arch helped to give birth to the building conservation movement as we know it today, but failed in its immediate objective. Prime Minister Harold Macmillan's cabinet approved the proposed demolition of the arch, and it was levelled by early 1962. This pub, one of a pair of former lodges on the edge of the station site, is almost all that now remains of Victorian Euston. So the exterior of today's station has very little in common with the original. Now, I've got this theory, which is that most people don't like the modern Euston station, not because of the modern station itself, but was what was destroyed for it to be built. Well, that's certainly true. There was such a controversy about the destruction of the Great Arch but uh, today that's really coloured our thinking about it. But we do forget that 19th century Euston wasn't particularly well liked either. It wasn't a great station to find your way around. It was dark, it was dank, it wasn't so grand. Hearing Andrew say that, I can imagine that when these plans for a new Euston were drawn up in the 60s, they probably seemed very exciting. Look, look at this, these clean lines, these bright spaces, this, this aeronautical age. 
Well, it's absolutely symbolic of that time. This is London in the heart of the swinging 60s, but it's also the age of the space race. And of course, the moon landings are just on the horizon, quite literally. And uh, so it's a very symbolic and very symbolic of the optimism of the age, but also the optimism of the new railway, the modern railway, moving away from the Victorian era. I love the figures in these drawings because, look, they're just they're so of their time. And look, you can tell that's clearly a railway worker in a new BR uniform. Railway worker in the new BR uniform, but this is very much part of the bigger picture. British Rail's new modern image. And uh, Euston Station, of course, is one of the ultimate examples of that. This appears to be a really spacious, kind of almost air terminal style design. So it's completely uncluttered. Because it's so open in space, you're able to do all sorts of things on this forecourt. So yeah. public art, for example, is very much of its time here, the very colourful art that's, uh, that's been um, suggested here by the artist. And so it's a wonderful open space, very, very different to the cluttered um, chaotic space of the original station. Well, I think I've spotted yeah. there's a statue, and if I'm not mistaken, is that not Stevenson's statue that was out there till quite recently? Well spotted. This is a statue of Robert Stevenson, the great Victorian engineer of the original London and Birmingham Railway. And this actually appeared in the original Euston station. This was added in 1870. It was commissioned by the Institute of Civil Engineers from the great uh, Victorian sculptor Baron Carlo Maraschetti. But he also reappears here in the 1960s vision of the station. And recently he's been taken down from the current Euston while the works take place for HS2. But he will be going back. So this statue has the distinction of being the only feature to survive the original station, the 1960s station, and the new 21st century station for HS2. Andrew, thank you so much for giving me special access to look at these. I never thought I'd see these. So, thank you. It's a pleasure. Nestled within the North Yorkshire National Park is a station with a long history that's become a modern icon. Look familiar, perhaps? Well, that's because it's in the Harry Potter films. Under the guise of Hogsmeade Station. Now, fans come to this heritage line in droves to visit this location for the wizard's big screen adventures. Here, they find a very real station that's actually called Gothland. Station Master John Bruce has been a volunteer here for the past 50 years. One of the fabulous things about Gotham is it's absolutely the typical country station of its time. Constructed in 1865 by the North Eastern Railway, the NER, Gothland was designed by the architect also responsible for the rather striking York station, Thomas Prosser. The gable ends are very typical stepped construction that he seemed to favour. And very much his trademark, you won't find these in other stations, purely in the ones that he designed. Prosser used local sandstone and designed the structure with living quarters for the station master. And initially, it was very much a work from home setup. When the station was opened, the tickets were sold through a hatchway from the station master's uh, living room. But in later years, the station master clearly needed a bit more space, so if you come into the building, you actually find that they moved the ticket office over to this side, where you can see the booking clerk uh, waiting to sell tickets. You can really see why movie makers are keen to roll their cameras here. If the whimsy of this time capsule booking office isn't enough, there's the authentic Northeastern Railway colour scheme of creamy buff and reddish brown paint adorning the signage and window frames right across the station. And there's plenty of nostalgia to satisfy even the most discerning cinema goer. But this station was not created as a film location. Its original purpose was as far from theatrical as it was possible to get because it was intended as a hard-working hub for freight, more used to hard graft than bright lights and grease paint. We're in what was the goods yard by the coal and lime drops. This was the main supply route into the, the village, 
There was a lot of coal came in for domestic use and the limestone as well, the crushed lime that was used for the fields as a fertiliser. The station was the transport focus of the village, really. As well as being crucial to the economy of the area, Gothland Station became a gateway for the villagers. But by the 1870s, as rail travel became ever more popular, the station required more facilities. Previously, there was no waiting room here, and it was built for the princely sum of £25 as a result of a petition from the villagers who they had to dash across to trains on this side if they were going to Pickering, Malton, or eventually on to London or places like that. We think there may have been another petition for some facilities for the ladies, because there was a gents' toilet on the other platform, but there were no ladies' facilities at all when the, the station was built. The station served the convenience of passengers until 1965, when Dr Beeching struck, giving the locals their biggest challenge. The chairman of British Railways set out to reduce the network, wielding what's become known as the Beeching Axe. His report saw Gotham Station closed, much to villagers' dismay. A group of local people decided they wanted to save the railway, and they got together in 1967. Within six years, with an awful lot of work, uh, the, the railways reopened. And John was there to signal the very first train back. Now, it's no secret I do love a signal box, and this one is a real gem of engineering history. It's quite fascinating to think that you're, you're doing a job that somebody was doing in 1866. The man doing my dream job today is Michael Entwistle. Each lever does a different job. Red levers are for signals. The black levers move the points, and that enables us to move a train from one track to another track. And the blue levers, they lock the points in place. Some levers are easier to pull than others. Some signals, which are way off in a distance, where the wire's a very long wire, because that's what you're doing, you're pulling the wire half a mile away. That's quite a hard pull. The railway here is single track, which means that two trains mustn't travel in opposite directions at the same time, or they'd crash. To ensure this doesn't happen, volunteers use a vintage technique with a bit of help from modern tech. We are working a signalling system with Victorian token machines which control a single line, but they're linked by 21st century broadband. At either end of each station on the line, there are identical token dispensing machines. Electronically connected to each other. As soon as a token is taken out of one machine, none of the others can produce another token. So, at any one time between two signal boxes, only one token is available and out at a time, to, and the driver must have that before he goes onto the single line. Once the train driver has cleared the single line section, he hands over the token to be inserted into the machine, thus unlocking the line again. This clever mix of the old and new is right up my street. It's a fabulous bit of Victorian engineering that ensures trains run safely, and it's, it's great to still have it working. I love how the commitment of the volunteers has paid off here, bringing tourists and film crews alike to experience Gothland Station. I've seen it grow from virtually nothing, been involved from the very early days of the railway, and enjoyed seeing it develop to what it is today, with a, a railway that carries almost 300,000 passengers a year, which is tremendous. From industrial transport hub to picturesque movie set, Gothland has played each role to perfection. And long may it continue, because if we've learned anything from our railway heritage, it's that the show must go on. I'm here at the awe-inspiring Fourth Bridge. A triumph of railway engineering and a Scottish icon. 
exploring this remarkable structure has already been a truly memorable experience. I've been fascinated by the epic story of the bridge's construction in the 1880s and moved by the sacrifice of the men who built it. Now I'm following where many of those brave men went before because I'm heading up to track level and intimidating 46 meters above the water. And just to add to my nerves, I'm traveling solo. <laughs> oh, it's, so we're going up at an angle now and you can just feel it tilting inwards and I can feel the shadows going past of this, this lift and the slowing down. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> well, we're, we're about halfway up. This is, this is track level. I can see from over there, just above the bothies and the wind is really blowing, only halfway up. Sometimes in life we have to suffer a little for our passions. Oh, Lord. But braving my fears couldn't be more worth it. Now, this is what I call extreme train spotting. <laughs> <laughs> the places I get to come to do this is phenomenal. Standing here alongside the track, though, you really get a feel for the magnificence of this structure. It's all-encompassing. It actually, it surrounds the train track, it surrounds me. In here, it feels like you're in this tunnel of steel, taking you securely from one side of the river to the other. It's quite brilliant, and it feels like you're almost on land. It's quite extraordinary, and this really is the genius of this design. One powerful way of expressing the magnificence of the fourth bridge is in numbers. Six and a half million rivets, 53,000 tons of steel. At its highest point, it's 110 meters above the water. But standing in the midst of all this wonderful engineering gives those stats a whole new meaning. Up close, you really get a feel for that handmade quality of the bridge, all the rivets together. Suddenly, you can see it's almost like a, a bridge made of Lego-sized pieces. You really get a feel for it. This was really built by people and not machinery. I mean, this is... This is really very special. Very special indeed. But here's one more important number. This bridge is over 130 years old. So it's no surprise that it needs constant maintenance. I'm on my way to find out just what that involves. Though with some trepidation, as it means going up even higher. Oh, here we go. <laughs> Once more onto the bridge. Project manager Mark Wilson leads a team taking care of the bridge and he's taking me to the top of the North Pier to talk about this essential work. Here comes the train just in time. It's a one, two, five. If I, if I do some train spotting, it might take my mind off things somewhat. <laughs> After that rare chance to see the trains from a whole new angle, I've made it. And from 90 meters up, the views are incredible. Wow. Well, I'm glad it isn't raining. It's not too breezy yet. It's nice wow. and sunny. Wow. I'm holding on, but this is... Wow. As offices go, <laughs> this is a pretty good one, right? <laughs> it definitely is, yes. You do get a sense of awe every time you walk out and you see the, the, gr the grandeur of it all. It's the biggest structure in Scotland. It's a privilege to be to be able to be in charge of a project working on the, the fourth bridge. So it's a great honour. Because it, it's from up here that you really get that that, that wow shot, yeah, isn't it? It's, absolutely, it's, it's, yes. And you can genuinely see for miles yeah. right the way down to Edinburgh. Is that, is that in fact you can see, can't you? You can see off the seat down yes, there. Yes, yeah. 
So whilst people come past here on the train and sort of, you know, sit there reading their papers or looking at their phones, oblivious to what's going around them, there are always staff here on the bridge examining and checking it and testing it. Absolutely, yes, yep. There's, uh, there's always examinations happening. So yeah, there is always someone around. That's fascinating. So this bridge always has, has guardians on it the whole time. Yes, there is, yeah. Custodians of the structure itself, yeah. I mean, do you get a sense of, 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 of the past when you're working on this bridge and those who've gone before you? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's a Victorian era uh, construction. Um, so it's, I mean, it's been around for a long, long time and it's seen, seen a lot of people working on it. So it's, it's, um, you want to carry on in that vein and, and do, it, do it justice. In the past, teams working here might have been engaged in a very particular task. One that became a byword for a job that never ends. But these days, that old adage has been shattered. Because there was always that phrase, you know, it's like, it's like painting a fourth bridge. Once you start one end, you finish the other, you start all over again. That's no longer the case, is it? No, it's not necessarily true, no. It's, um, so the paint systems that we put on nowadays, they, they have a 25-year design life. So it'll be, in effect, it'll be 25 years before you need to come back and paint. But it does take a few years to paint it in the first case. Rather them than me. This incredible structure has a painted area of 230,000 square metres, requiring 240,000 litres of paint. It's another startling fact about this astonishing bridge, which I'm so fortunate to see from this vantage point. This is a very privileged position for me to be standing in, because not many folk get to come up here, do they? No, they don't. Uh, so, I mean, that is part of Network Rail's plan to make it more accessible to everyone. There is a visitor centre which has planning permission in place just now. But, yeah, the plan would be in the future to open this area up to, to allow everybody to, to come and visit it. What's coming next for the bridge? In the future, the, you know, Network Rail have committed to decarbonising the route by 2035 in line with Scottish Government. Uh, requirements. Oh, it's fascinating to see how that actually is delivered and, and, and what those changes are, because, you know, how do you carry electric trains over this massive steel structure? It'll be fascinating to see. Yeah, it'll be interesting, yeah. We've got the, the best minds working on it. Yeah, absolutely. It's wonderful. And then even now, this bridge is presenting engineering challenges for the team who are running the rail. Definitely, yes, it is, yeah. Here comes another train. <laughs> And after one more round of high altitude train spotting. You see, I looked down. I did look down. I did look down. Look. <laughs> At last, it's finally time for me to return to Terra Firma. But what an incredible journey it's been, and truly an honour to walk in the footsteps of the unbelievably brave men who built this architectural phenomenon over 130 years ago. I might have come here as a somewhat reluctant climber of one of the most iconic Scottish bridges, but as I leave here, I'll be always thinking of the stories of the Briggers, the men who built one of the greatest railway wonders of the world. Next time, I discover the secrets of Manchester revealed by its railway architecture. I had no idea this was here. I thought the whole thing was demolished. This is extraordinary. And visit a Victorian station catapulted into the 21st century.